thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with the thematic relevance of the tale, which is perhaps not quite as clear as the previous ones. Um, so fire and ice to me suggests sort of hot and cold, hot being a sort of, you know, uh, exciting, interesting story and cold being sort of slow and boring. And this story that I'm going to tell is exactly both of those things. Um, it sounds really exciting and interesting and maybe a little frightening, but it's actually uh, terrifically banal and um, boring. The experience. And the experience is going to the National Congress of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I went to the KKK's National Congress in 2010. It happens over the August long weekend, so we just missed the 2012 edition. Um, I went as a freelance journalist and undercover, which means I didn't tell anybody that I was uh, a journalist. I just sort of went, kept to myself to try to watch and see what was happening. Um, the Congress itself takes place in the middle, literally, of the Ozarks Forest in southwest Arkansas. It's a sort of um, a campground space, a clearing in the middle of the forest. It's like only visible from above. Uh, there's a sort of barn, uh, what's it called, uh, a barn sort of community uh, meeting hall type space that they use as a, a meeting hall and a church. And there's a sort of bungalow office for the KKK's administrative activities. They have extensive web presence. Um, and the average uh, age of people at the Congress was sort of 50 plus. Most people are sort of corpulent and soft from driving a lot. Um, and there were about a dozen children there ranging from like toddlers to teenagers taller than me. Um, so obviously uh, way more happened over the weekend than I could possibly talk about in seven minutes. So I'm just going to tell uh, the sort of like highlight reel of the National Congress to give you a sense of what happened and how crazy it was and some of the uh, surprising uh, challenges that I faced when I was there. Um, so the, the bulk of the weekend from Friday to Sunday uh, is uh, speeches uh, from the rank and file, ordinary members. There were about 40 to 60 people in total over the entire weekend. Uh, the KKK is a really a dying community in America. Um, there are other large, thriving white power groups, but they're not the KKK. Um, most of the uh, speeches uh, are sort of like state of my personal union. So contrary to what you saw a month ago at the Democratic and Republican, or less than a month ago at the Democratic and Republican conventions, um, where they're talking about policy and action and what we need to do at the KKK Congress, they're talking about um, weird experiences with black people under the loose rubric racial awakening. Um, so t I'll just give one example from a woman called Georgina who spoke on the first night. She's about 65. She's very circular. And, uh, and she talked about a friend of hers. She, uh, Georgina is from Oklahoma, and she used to visit her friend also in Oklahoma. And she would drive down, and her friend was very sort of feisty and excited and sort of wore the pants in the family. She didn't say that, but that's essentially what she was getting at. And the husband was very sort of timid and shy. But then this one time, Georgina went to visit her friend, and the friend was timid and shy, and the husband was very sort of feisty and now wearing the pants and very aggressive, not in a physical way, in a just sort of, you know, speaking his mind and so on. And the, the wife, you know, said, you know, Georgina, things have changed. And they wrung their hands about this for a while and talked about the dynamic, how it shifted. And so then Georgina was driving home, and she thought to herself, I, you know, I know what happened. Her husband had recently had surgery. He'd had a liver transplant. Wait for it. Um, I bet he got a liver from a black man. And so a month or so goes by, and Georgina and her friend are visiting on the phone. And in, you know, the, the husband is going for these post-op checkups and so on, pretty standard. And just in the ordinary course, he asks the doctor, you know, where did my liver come from? Which I would probably ask if I had a liver transplant just for kicks. And the doctor gets on the computer and looks it up and turns out, you know, the liver comes from a 17-year-old African-American. And Georgina goes, bingo which is crazy. <laughs> but this woman, so the, co the Congress, you're, we're sitting at these tables the whole time. It's sort of a grid of three by four, and the tables all have red, white, and blue tablecloths, because it's a big, it's, it's very conservative politics, so it's sort of like Tea Party-ish, but racist. And this woman, Georgina, sat, I sat at her table with her husband, and they're both, they're, they're really nice. And she asked me all these really nice questions, and she wasn't overly invasive, and like, because I was, you know, undercover and not really wanting to talk about myself so much. And at one point, she asked me for my address so she could send me a Christmas card. And this was the woman who got up and told this weird story about the liver from the black man. 
Um, and so the whole weekend, Friday night and then all of Saturday, is really just a series of speeches like this. And they're not all sort of like medically nuts, but they're, so they have, they're a sort of similar theme on the racial awakening thing. And it becomes really obvious by the, like lunch on Saturday that it is super inappropriate for me to be here. Um, like I don't know what the uh, like the criterion for justifying um, undercover journalistic ops is. I pres off the top of my head, I would say it's some sort of like public interest. So there's some sort of dangerous group, and you infiltrate, and then you protect the public by revealing this truth. Um, but this is just 40 to 60 really old, scared, tired people who like come to the middle of a forest to talk to each other about stuff that nobody else will listen to them about. Um, it was so awkward and nervous. And so then we get to Sunday morning, there's a church service, and then there's some more speeches, and then we're in the afternoon, the big activity is a cross-raising. Um, so the closing ceremony is gonna involve a cross-burning. It has something to do with like the light of Christ clearing the darkness on earth or something like this. Um, but in order to like burn the cross, you need to raise it up first. And so Saturday, Sunday afternoon, all the guys, literally all the dudes are outside raising this cross up, and I'm standing on the slope in the middle of the clearing with another guy called David, who's the MC for the weekend. And we're watching everybody raise up the cross. And I'm thinking, like, should I go and help, maybe, for the story, right? Like, get my hands dirty and get in there. But also, like, it's so inappropriate. And, like, why don't I just leave these people alone? And David starts talking to me, and we're doing that thing where like the guy, like two guys talk seriously to each other and they both look straight ahead and nod at each other. <laughs> and he starts saying, you know, Chris, I, I'm so pleased that you came to see us and you of your own like volition found us out and came down just to hear what we have to say and gave us a chance. And you know, I know everybody here thinks the same way I do. We're so pleased and we would be so pleased if you would you know, help out just as much or as little as you want. If that's what you decided and came and helped us, that would be wonderful. And I know everybody would like that. And so, of course, my immediate reaction is just, oh, you know, I don't want to find out that I'm the guy the KKK wants on their team. <laughs> um, but also, it's, it's very obvious that, like, David has just made, made this very serious, genuine, sincere, uh, overture to me. This is a big sort of formative part of his life. Crazy as it, it may be, it means a lot to him. He actually moved his family from Phoenix, Arizona to the middle of the Ozarks Forest so he could live near the headquarters um, and participate and help out with the organization. And he's made this overture to me and I'm standing there lying to him, like complete. I'm really just there to make fun of them and smear and sneer and I'm at the I'm I'm at the KKK Congress and I'm feeling ashamed and weird, and so thankfully I don't have to actually um, respond because there's a problem with the cross. They there nobody has a rope or whatever, so they can't hoist it up, um, and so he goes off to like help out with that, and so I didn't have to respond. And so they eventually like up goes the cross and we go inside and I'm feeling all this like genuine shame and so on. And then the like the real highlight of Sunday afternoon turns out to be a racist sock puppet show. Um, and there's there, I'll just give you a brief pricey of it. There are three um, white sock puppets called Shirley, Mercy and Goodness. And they are lambs and they're on one side of the, this river or some sort of gorge. And then on the other side, there is a like a nice pasture that they want to get and they each try to cross and they're intercepted first by a black sock, who's like a thug. Second by a brown sock with an enormous, well, for a sock puppet, marijuana cigarette sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> um, and then the third, uh, the third one is intercepted by a tan sock with a towel over his head carrying a backpack of dynamite. Um, anyway, so over the rest of that, I'm just gonna draw a curtain of charity. Um, and fast forward to the closing ceremony, because the cross is up now, right? So the closing ceremony, um, you really have to stick around because this is the time when they have the hoods and the robes, which are really expensive, actually, it turns out. I asked about this. Um, they are, they're actually, they're like really nice um, if you touch them. Uh, they are. Um, so uh, what happens is there's a, it's sort of in a clearing and they got the, the cross is like 20 feet. So it's, it's, it's actually probably a little bit taller than this ceiling. Um, and it's blazing on fire. They wrap it in this like black tarp and soak it with diesel. That's the big part of the cross raising in the afternoon. So it's just this like burning diesel rag. And they're all, there's like a dozen of uh, them in the hoods and the robes and they have these flaming torches and that's what they light the cross with. 
and the national director gives a sort of like speech you know there's a ceremony and so on and everybody else is standing around and like taking pictures like it's going out of style and i am taking pictures tons of pictures um and then after the ceremony is over all of the guys in the hoods like get together in front and there's like a team picture in front of the burning cross so i'm getting pictures of this and i'm like 10 minutes away from leaving because i'm to be, i was bored the whole time i was super bored from like saturday morning onwards because it's just it's awkward and it's uncomfortable and it's just ridiculous non sequitur after ridiculous non sequitur but how can you leave before the cross burning right and so I'm taking all these pictures, and then after they get the team picture, then the, it's you, it's mostly the like husbands and the fathers who are the member of the who have the like the full regalia. So they take off their hoods, and then all of the family comes up, and so they get the like family picture in front of the burning cross. So you know, like what you would see on the front of a Christmas card. Um, so I'm I'm taking pictures of this, and the whole time I'm sitting next to this woman called April, who's like 18 years old, and she's like eight months pregnant or something. And so her mother had asked me to like escort her down the slope to the there's like some benches where we're all the audience, as it were, is sitting like 12 of us, because um, it was slippery, right? And she's eight months pregnant, and it's treacherous. So I was like, sure, no problem. And we're chatting, and it's you know she's really really nice, but also saying all this weird stuff about her like boss at Subway, who's Indian, like full stop. Um, and but you know like, it's like gratuitous at this point and so i'm taking these pictures and she's there and we're chatting and um nobody to this point over the entire two and a half days has asked me if i was a reporter they've just been entirely credulous and like welcomed me into their thing uh the the congress and so she says april says to me you know can i see some of your pictures as one does right i got the like crap digital camera so i show her the picture you know like the little screen um, so I show her and so on and we're standing there and I'm like five minutes away from getting in my car and leaving and like God le getting out of here and out of nowhere apropos of nothing she says I just have to ask are you a reporter um, and I'm gonna end this story there because I still don't have a good answer for April thanks <laughs>